Thank you for joining me in my next video. Today's video is going to be all about batting statistics, explaining what all of these different acronyms mean in the game of baseball and how they're used. If you watched the previous video in this series, you would have learned all about pitching stats. But you also would have learned that there's a difference between traditional stats and more recent advanced stats. Once again in this video, I'm going to talk mostly about traditional stats, counting stats and averages that have been used in the game of baseball for generations. And so now let's jump into the other side of the pitcher-batter duel, batting stats. Just like pitching, batting is based off of two general ideas, getting on base and scoring runs. Although there is an entire team of players, nine batters that hit for each team every game, batting stats have always been considered in isolation. So how good is that player at getting on base and scoring runs? The first most basic counting stat for batters is plate appearances. Every time a batter comes to the plate, it's counted as a plate appearance, no matter what the result is. Now, a closely related stat is the at-bat. So what's the difference between a plate appearance and an at-bat? Well, that's where it gets interesting. As I said before, a plate appearance is counted no matter what the result is. But an at-bat is only counted if a batter does one of three things, and that's reaching base safely on a base hit, getting an out, or reaching base on an error. That means that a plate appearance that results in either a walk or a hit batter or something like that doesn't count as an at-bat. There are a couple of minor exceptions to this, but for the purposes of this video, I'm going to keep it simple like that. If you want to learn more about the exceptions, look at sacrifice flies or bunts. You may be wondering why there's a difference between plate appearances and at-bats. I'll get into that a little bit later when we start talking about rate stats, like batting averages and on-base percentages. After this, we have counting stats that are all about what resulted from that plate appearance. So we have walks, which happen every time a batter receives four balls without the pitcher getting him out. Next is a strikeout, which is when a batter receives three strikes in one plate appearance, either with or without swinging, and the pitcher is able to get him out. The next one is hit by pitch. These are counted when a batter is hit by a pitch. And just a quick reminder that if the batter swings at a pitch that hits him, it's not counted as a hit by pitch. It's a strike. Next, we've got hits. And these are counted whenever a batter hits the ball and gets on base safely. So if he hits a ball and it's fielded and that batter is thrown out, or a fly ball that's caught in the air, these are not counted as hits. A hit is only when the batter reaches base safely. And hits are further divided up into singles, doubles, triples, and home runs. These are all based off of how far the batter is able to run based on that hit. If they hit the ball and it's just a ground ball and they reach first base, it's a single. If they hit the ball further or maybe down a foul line and they reach second base, it's a double. If they're able to get all the way to third, it's a triple. And then finally, a home run is either when a batter hits the ball all the way over the outfield fence in the air, or sometimes when the batter hits the ball, it stays inside the field of play, but because of how fast that batter is, or it's misplayed by the outfielders, and he's able to run all the way around the bases and back to home before the ball can be thrown in. Now, the sum of all of these hits is what's called total bases. The total bases a player has is simple calculation, where a single counts as one base, double counts as two, triple counts as three, and a home run counts as four. So essentially, how many bases a player is able to get on one single hit. So if a batter is able to get one single, one triple, and one home run in one game, the total bases he has for that game is eight. Total bases are only given for the hit itself, not for running the bases when the next player is up to hit. The importance of total bases is to really evaluate not only who hits the ball the most often, but who hits the ball the hardest, the best. Because the players that hit the ball hard and far have more doubles and triples and home runs, thereby having more total bases. Now, just like my pitching video, everything we've talked up to this point is all about getting on base. But really, games are won and lost because of runs scored. So the next few stats we're going to talk about have more to do with scoring runs than just getting on base. And the simplest place to start is with runs. Runs are counted every time that runner crosses home plate and scores a run. Pretty simple. It doesn't matter how they reach base. A base hit, an error, a walk. As long as they come all the way around to home plate and score a run, then they're credited with a run. The next stat is called run batted in, RBI. An RBI is counted for a player when his base hit causes a run to be scored. This can happen if there's a runner on second base, a player gets a base hit, and that runner that was on second scores a run. 
then the batter gets an RBI, a run batted in. It's awarded to the player that was currently at bat that hit the ball. And it's possible in one single at bat to get all the way from one RBI to four RBIs if that player hits a home run with the bases loaded, meaning that each of those players on the three bases scored runs plus the batter himself that hit the home run. For most runs scored, there's a credit for both a run for the player that scored the run and a run batted in for the player that caused that run to be scored. There are a few exceptions when a run is counted, but a run batted in is not counted, such as when a runner on third base steals home on their own, or they score because of a wild pitch or a passed ball or an error. In those cases, the batter that was up at the plate does not get credited with an RBI. Now I'm going to go over a couple quick examples to make sure we're all on the same page about runs and RBIs. Example 1. RBIs do not have to be from hits only. They can be awarded if a batter gets a walk or is hit by a pitch when the bases are loaded. The run is awarded to the runner on third base and the RBI is awarded to the batter. Example 2. If there's a runner on first and third and a batter hits a ball that scores one run but that batter is thrown out at first base, the run is awarded to the runner on third base and the RBI is awarded to the batter even though he was not safe at first. Example 3. If there's runners at first and third base and the batter hits a ball that scores one run but the defense gets the runner out at second base and the runner out at first base. This is called a double play and is a rare instance when a batter is not accredited with an RBI even though a run is scored. The run is awarded to the runner at third base but no RBI is awarded. In our example number four, in this case the bases are loaded. There's runners at first, second, and third base. The batter hits the ball to the shortstop and the shortstop throws it over the first baseman's head. Three runs score and the batter ends up on second base. Well, in this case, a run is awarded to each of the runners that scored, but since it was an error that allowed them to score, no RBIs are awarded to the batter. Example number five. In this scenario, runners are on second base and third base. The batter hits a home run. Well, runs are awarded to the two base runners, second and third, and the batter, he gets a run. And on top of that, there are three RBIs that are awarded to the batter because his hit allowed three runs to score. So that batter not only gets a run, but also an RBI. Next, we're gonna lump in a couple base running stats, simply because there aren't that many that are actually counted as traditional stats. There's really only two of note, stolen bases and caught stealing. A stolen base is counted when a runner decides to run on a pitcher and is able to reach the next base without being thrown out. Now, if the batter were to hit the ball in this case, either fair or foul, then the stolen base wouldn't count. Caught stealing is when a runner makes the same attempt, but he's thrown out instead of reaching that base safely. And then of course, there's a ratio. Your stolen base percentage is how many stolen bases you have out of how many attempts overall. So your number of stolen bases divided by your number of stolen bases and caught stealing added together. Now that we've covered the basic counting stats, let's jump over into rate stats or calculated stats. Rate stats are important because it helps us more easily compare players. Imagine if player A gets 180 hits in a season out of 600 at bats, but player B gets 150 hits in a season out of only 450 at bats, maybe because he was injured part of the year. Well, which player is better? Player A got more hits, but player B got hits at a much higher rate. So this is where we bring in rate stats, where the key difference between plate appearances and at bats that we discussed earlier comes into play. The first rate stat and most widely recognized is batting average. This is simply the number of hits divided by the number of at bats. So in our example, player A would have had 180 hits and 600 at bats for a batting average of 300, which is considered a really good year for most players. But player B would have had 150 hits and 450 at bats for a batting average of 333, which would be considered among the best players in the league. So even though player A had more hits, perhaps player B is actually the better player. An important note about batting average is that it doesn't take into account the type of hit. A single has just as much value as a double or a triple or a home run. So batting average is simply how many times that player hit the ball and got on base safely compared to how many at-bats they had. 
Batting average is one of the universal tools that we've used ever since the 1850s, and it shows how hard it is to actually hit a baseball, especially at the professional level. The league batting average has historically been about 250, meaning for every 100 at bats, an average major leaguer reaches base safely on a hit only 25 times, and they get out 75 times. In the 2021 season, the league batting average was even lower at 243, showing how hard it is to reach base safely. But over time, as we started getting a little bit smarter about statistics, we started to realize that batting average doesn't tell the complete story. It doesn't tell the story of how hard a batter can actually hit the ball or how often they get on base from things like walks or being hit by pitches. And that's where on-base percentage comes in. On-base percentage was invented somewhere around the 1940s, 1950s, and usually said to have been invented by Branch Rickey, the same guy who signed and introduced Jackie Robinson to break the color barrier in Major League Baseball. But even though it was thought up by Mr. Rickey that long ago, it only became a widely used stat around the 1980s. It's calculated by taking the total number of times that a player reaches base safely and dividing that number by the total number of plate appearances. So this is where the key difference between at-bats and plate appearances comes in. At-bats is used for calculating batting average, and plate appearances, which accounts for walks and hit by pitch, is used to calculate on-base percentage. So to show you quickly how important on-base percentage is to look at, we're going to take the example of both player A and player B again. Going back, player A had 180 hits out of 600 at-bats. But he also reached base safely an additional 120 times through walks and hit by pitches. His on-base percentage would therefore be 300 times on base divided by 720 plate appearances for an on-base percentage of 417. This means for every 100 plate appearances, player A reached base safely about 42 times, which is really good. Player B, on the other hand, had 150 hits out of 450 at bats, giving him that batting average of 333 but he also reached base safely an additional 50 times through walks and hit by pitch. His on-base percentage would therefore be 200 times on-base total, divided by 500 plate appearances for an on-base percentage of 400. Now, both of these on-base percentages for player A and player B are actually really good. Any on-base percentage above 350 is actually considered to be a pretty good player, and above 400 is all-star level. So both of these players are really great. But when you start counting for walks and hit by pitch, then you may actually see that player A, even though he had a batting average of only 300, may actually be the better player compared to player B, who had a much higher batting average, but a lower on-base percentage. The next great stat that goes even further is called slugging percentage. Slugging percentage doesn't just count how many times you hit the ball and get on base safely, but it actually quantifies how much power that hitter has how hard or how far they hit the ball consistently. Just like batting average, slugging percentage only counts hits and doesn't take into account walks or hit by pitch, but it counts hits differently, whether they're singles, doubles, triples, or home runs. It's calculated by total bases divided by the number of at-bats, where, as we discussed before, doubles are worth two, triples are worth three, and home runs are worth four. And obviously, as a result, the more doubles, triples, and especially home runs that a player hits, the higher their slugging percentage is going to be. A slugging percentage higher than 450 is considered to be a pretty good player, and a slugging percentage above 600 is an elite player in today's game. Now, we're still not getting into advanced analytics, but we're catching up with the times a little bit more by introducing another stat that was invented around the 1980s, but it's still just a rate stat. And this is OPS, which stands for On Base Plus Slugging Percentage. It was devised by people who realized that the best way to evaluate how good a player actually is is to look at their on base percentage and their slugging percentage. So, how good are they at getting on base? and how good are they at hitting the ball with power. Some players are really good at getting on base, but they only hit singles and don't hit very many doubles, triples, or home runs. And on the other hand, some players are really good at hitting home runs, but if they're not hitting a home run, they're just not very good at getting on base. The best players in the league bring these two players together, and they can do both getting on base and hit with power. And like I said, OPS is simple. You just add on-base percentage and slugging percentage together. So a player that has an on-base percentage of 350, which is pretty good, but a slugging percentage of 400, which isn't that great, has an OPS of 750. On the other hand, a player that doesn't get on-base very often has an on-base percentage of 300, but their slugging percentage is 500 because they hit a lot more home runs. When you add those two together, it's still an OPS of only about 800. And like I mentioned, the best players in the league do both. So a player that has an on-base 
base percentage of 400 and a slugging percentage of 600 has an OPS of 1, or sometimes stated as 1,000. Now, typically an OPS of about 850 is considered to be a pretty good player. Anything approaching or definitely over 1,000 is an elite player, one of the best in the game. I'll mention this one more time. OPS sometimes is thought of as an advanced analytic or sabermetric tool, but it's not. It's simply using two rate stats that have been around for quite some time on base percentage and slugging percentage to evaluate who the best players in the game are. It still does nothing to be able to compare players that play in different ballparks or that have played in different eras. And that's where, once again, advanced analytics, sabermetrics, advanced metrics, whatever you want to call them, come in. Everything that we talked about in today's video are more traditional stats. Things that have either been around for a long time, like counting stats, or rate stats that maybe are a little bit more recently developed, but still based on the very simple principles of getting hits and getting on base and hitting with power. But where advanced analytics come in and why they're important is it helps us to compare players against each other that play for different teams or in different eras. Like I discussed with the pitching video, if you take the same hitter and put him for the Los Angeles Dodgers, where they play at sea level in a pretty big ballpark, he may not hit as many home runs as that same player would playing for the Colorado Rockies, where the air is really thin. So adjusting their stats to league averages allows us to be able to compare these players and actually see who had the better season. Even if the guy in Colorado hit more home runs, he may not have actually had the better season. And as we've discussed in other videos, the history of baseball has been full of errors that have been either dominated by hitting or dominated by pitching. And a really high batting average or slugging percentage from the 1920s and 30s may not be nearly as impressive as a really high batting average from the 1960s. So we adjust for these things by using these formulas that are all described as part of advanced analytics to be able to compare players across teams, across seasons, and even across eras. So that sums up batting statistics that I wanted to share with you, at least in this video. As I've said before, check out other videos to come for more information on advanced analytics if you find that interesting. And join me next time where I'm going to talk more about defensive statistics. Hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, leave me some comments, and I hope to see you again next time when we talk more about baseball.